Lord, we just desire to be close to you this morning. Draw us near to you. Cross 
Draw me 
Heavenly Father, we're thankful uh, for the time of worship that we can worship you in, in spirit and in truth. And Lord, we just ask that uh, our worship is received from wherever we are, whether we're at home or in our living room. Lord, I pray that wherever you are, that would be a place where we worship you in spirit and in truth. We ask that you would bless the time that we share together. We ask that you would uh, reveal through your word and speak to us. May our hearts be open. May we be receptive to what you want to uh, say to us and help us, God, to be not just hearers but doers. Let us, let us apply what it is that you want to speak to our lives today. And may we be truly changed and transformed as we listen and hear uh, the, the ministry of your word today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us uh, today, and uh, the title of the message is entitled The Great Coronavirus Divide. Now, last week I started a, a series entitled Going to God's House. In light of the uh, activities that have happened this past week, I uh, I've kind of changed it as I kind of feel like the Lord is... Uh, shared uh, with me some thoughts just on our nation and our country. And, uh, and so um, I just want to talk to us about the great coronavirus divide. And our text today is, in, is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 10 through 11. And these are Paul's words to us. He says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Of course, this is the Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthian believers, the church, as they are experiencing some contention, some division. Uh, in the church, and, and Paul writes to them to, uh, uh, to remind them that there should be no divisions within their church, and that uh, one of the characteristics of the, the church should be that of unity. Uh, you know, the last uh, few uh, months really have really presented a near constant array of complex challenges that's related to uh, shepherding a church you know, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, the latest complex challenges is perhaps the trickiest yet, and that is how do we resume in-person gatherings? You know, because the, this regathering has the potential to be divisive as everyone has different convictions about the issue. Uh, and so I would encourage you that you would please... Con consider other people and adopt the characteristic of love as we uh, regather. And uh, as, uh, the, as I want to share with you kind of an article that I, I had found that was written by Brett McCracken uh, entitled Church Family, Don't Let Coronavirus Divide Us. And I felt like it was very appropriate for our church because I feel that this could be a very 
uh, volatile point for the church as we regather. And some of the things that he said, and I want to uh, quote to you, it says, as these details are challenging enough how to maintain social distancing, how to limit crowd size, whether or not to require to wear masks or to sing or not to sing, what to do with children, uh, meeting sooner or waiting longer, and, and so on. The whole conversation is fraught with potential division. And uh, we need to move forward in beautiful unity uh, rather than ugly division. And it won't be easy, but by God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit working to unify us in ways that our flesh resist, we can model unity to the rest of the world. And we have this opportunity to model love that places the interests of others above ourselves. Uh, just for example, someone might find it personally difficult to have to wear a mask during church or stay six feet away from everyone at all times. And you might think that these precautions are a needless overreaction, but here's the thing. Even if it turns out that you're right, can you not sacrifice your ideal for a season out of love for others who believe the precautions are necessary? Even if you personally think it is silly or somewhat even cowardly for someone to stay at home or even after the church is open again on Sundays, can, can we not heed Paul's wisdom in Romans 14, 13, where he said, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. Or 1 Corinthians 8, 9 says, be careful, however, that your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. You know what, it's harder to make this decision really to, to open back up than it was to close. But you know, there are so many things that can divide us. We can be divided doctrinally. You know, you, you remember the story of a man who was uh, marooned on a desert island when a ship came to rescue him. The captain learned that the man had lived alone on this island for five years. There were three huts, so he asked about them. The man said that he lived in the... Uh, in the first one, then that's what. Then what's the second hut for? The captain asked. The man said, "That's where I go to church." What about the third hut? The captain asked. The man replied, "Oh, that's where I used to go to church." You see, it's we can be so divided doctrinally. Uh, we can be divided as far as even end times is concerned. The return of Christ, pre, mid, post tribulation, or the millennial reign of Christ. Uh, or we can be divided over issues such as baptism in the Holy Spirit, of speaking in tongues when you are filled. Uh, I mean, the church can be so uh, divisive on doctrines, and that's the important need for unity, uh, you know. And so we can even be divided. Uh, division can take place uh, for non-doctrinal reasons, such as music styles and clothing styles and pro uh, building projects are often sources of divisions. You know, we can be, our nation can be divided racially. You know, this George Floyd incident uh, that was choked to death by the knee of a police officer in Minneapolis uh, died at the hands of the, the very people that are supposed to be protecting our citizens. You know, there's this division between police force and those racially prejudged. You know, what happened to George Floyd is inexcusable and it should never happen. And justice needs to be served, but in seeking justice, we can't fall into the trap of prejudging every police officer we see. Our nation is divided rationally. Not only is, are we divided rationally, we can be divided doctrinally, and we can be even divided as a nation. The United States is not necessarily united, it's, it seems as if we are divided states. Our nation really convulses with pain and anger and hatred as what started in peaceful protests have developed into violence and crime that has escalated. We've seen people protest you know, his death by destroying property and dreams of people in their community. Yes, there should be a protest, 
but we do not have license to perform criminal acts because we are angry. America is at a very sad place right now, and churches across the nation need to have a time of prayer. And we need to pray for unity in our nation. You see, it's not a protest that we need. It's a pray test. And we need peace and we need reconciliation. You see, our, our nation is also divided politically, whether between Democrats, d- Democrats or Republicans. You know what? We are a divided country, divided over issues of abortion, same-sex marriages, legalizing weed, border patrol, security, and the endless list goes on and on. And I believe that Satan is laughing at us because this is exactly what he wants. Jesus said these words, that a house that's divided against itself cannot stand. You know, last week was Pentecost Sunday. It's the celebration of 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus where God poured out his spirit upon the church, on the early believers, and essentially the church was born or birthed. And it's when God empowered uh, the disciples to really to carry out the mission of Jesus. And before they had started this mission, they needed to be filled with the Spirit before they went. And Jesus gave them this command in Acts chapter 1, uh, verse number 4 and 5. He said, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. You see, Jesus felt that it was so important for them uh, before they started their mission that they were filled with God's presence and his spirit, that they were baptized in the Holy Ghost. And uh, there were several uh, keys to this Pentecostal outpouring. If there's ever a day and age where Uh, we need a move of God or an outpouring of God's Spirit, it is today. And today we are primed or we are at a place of, uh, of God's presence and His power that is so desperately needed. We need an outpouring of His Spirit. Now, the early church, as they gathered, there were two essential characteristics that caused this outpouring to happen. One was that they prayed the Bible says in Acts 1.14, it says that these all continued with one accord in prayer, supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. You see, the church prayed. As Jesus said, go and wait, they prayed. While they waited, they prayed and they sought God. If we're going to have an outpouring of God's Spirit in this present day, then the church needs to pray. Be a praying church. Praying, when we pray, that's when God's presence and his spirit comes. Let's be a praying church, not a a prayerless church. And that's something that we need to continue to do this day and age. The second characteristic that we see was not only were they a praying church and it brought the outpouring of God's spirit, but they were a, a church that was in unity says in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. You see, the Spirit came and poured out upon them when they were praying And they were in unity, in one place, in one accord. Now these two are two key essentials for a Pentecostal outpouring, that we need more prayer than what we are presently doing, and we also need more unity. I want to focus on the unity aspect, because unity is one of the essential keys for God pouring out his spirit, and unity is what we need today. And we can do so much more together than we can by ourselves. You know, one of the many things Jesus is presently doing right now 
is he is praying for us. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25 says that he is able to save the uttermost, those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. What is Jesus doing at present? He is interceding. That intercession means he is praying for others. See, in our prayer times, we don't not necessarily need to pray just prayers for ourselves, but we are instructed to pray for others. And so our prayer time needs to focus in on praying for the needs of others. That's what Jesus does. Jesus is praying for the needs of other people. And I am thankful today that, that God, that Jesus is right now praying for us. And he is praying for others. And he is praying for believers. And he is cheering for us. And he is rooting for us. And he is cheering for you. And he is praying for you. Now, what is it that Jesus is praying for us about? Now, John chapter 17, it mentions several things as it opens up to us a a picture of God's heart, of what he is praying for us about. And these are his desires for us, not really desires, and they may surprise you because they're not for our success or our prosperity or our happiness. No, Jesus prayed several things. One, he prayed that we would have eternal life by glorifying the Son. He prayed that we would be protected from the evil one. He prayed that we would be sanctified by the truth, that we would be holy. He prayed that we would be kept uh, uh, from falling away. He prayed that we would have joy. And then he also prayed that we would have unity, that we would love each other. In John 17, verse number 20, look at this. He says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe, future believers, in me through their word. How many know it's important for us to give opportunity for uh, people to get saved so that they can become followers and believers in Christ? And Jesus is saying, I'm praying for those future believers. What is he praying? That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. You see, Jesus prays for unity in this church because unity matters to God. You know, we, we, unity matters for, to, in, in certain three areas. The first, one is, the first one is this, that we have unity with God, and then we have unity within uh, between each other, and then unity in the church and unity in our marriages and in our families. Now, why pray for unity? Three reasons. As you can see, my wife got ahead of me, but that's okay. Uh, The first reason we need to pray for unity is because unity creates a strong bond. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12 is a passage often used for marriages But it really talks to us about the power of two. And it says, though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. You know, one of the things that that we can do so much more together than we can apart. I'm reminded of the uh, Red Rover. I think that's the the game that we used to play. And that is that it, as you locked arms with your your friends and somebody tried to run through and break through that and if the bond was weak they would break through that and it would create a gap of separation where they could come through and that's what the enemy wants to do he wants to bring division and tear the bond down between people the bond that unites us is love love is the characteristic that joins us together now in ecclesiastes he tells us that If we are not bound together, then we may be overpowered. But if we have more than one, we can overpower the enemy. And a threefold cord referencing God in our marriages are not quickly broken. I mean, you know, marriages are broken. Homes are broken. uh, Churches are, are broken. 
because the bond between them has been weakened. And one way that we can, uh, why we need to pray for unity is simply because we can do more things to better together and overpower the enemy than we can by ourselves. Listen, church is split over the color of paint or whether Adam and Eve had a belly button. Marriage is split too. And so I just want to encourage you why we need to pray for unity is because it creates such a strong bond in our families, in our church, and in our relationship with God. Another reason why we need to pray for unity, the second reason is, is that unity creates a perfect atmosphere for the Spirit to move. In Psalms 133, verse 1 and 2, it says, Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. You know, obviously that's a reason to have unity because it's more pleasant. When we get along, there is, it's a joy for us to be around each other. But when there is odds against each other, there is an unpleasantness. There is an uncomfortability. And the scripture says it's good and it's pleasant when we as brethren live together in unity. Verse 2 says, it is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. And he uses it as an illustration of anointing Aaron as the high priest. As they anointed him for that position, uh, they uh, put oil upon him, and that oil ran down uh, upon his head, down upon his beard, and upon the edge of his garments. Obviously, oil in the Bible represents the move of the Holy Spirit. So what, in a sense, he is saying is when there is unity, it is pleasing and it is good. And when we live together in unity, it also creates an atmosphere for the oil to come and saturate our lives. You also know, as we read earlier in Acts chapter 2, is when they were in one accord, we know that the oil from heaven came down and saturated them like tongues of fire that ignited them, filled them with oil and like a candle, a flame set over their head. You see, when we live together in unity, it creates an atmosphere for the spirit and the presence of God to move. So when there is division, then the Holy Spirit is grieved and his spirit is removed from our place. And so it's so important that we want the presence of God, we want the spirit of God to move, that we have this unity that houses the presence of God. The third thing of reason why we need to pray for unity is that unity creates a strong voice for evangelism. In John chapter uh, 17, not just yet, I'll get there. I'm going to read John 13 first. I don't, it's not up there. But it says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another, but this by this... All will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You know, he's saying love will show the world that you are followers of Jesus. John 17, verse 21 and 23, it says, I do not pray for these alone but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. So there it is. There it is again. In other words, he is saying unity creates a belief. Disunity fosters disbelief. In other words, who wants to board a ship of bickering sailors? Paul Bilheimer said this, the continuous and widespread fragmentation of the church has been the scandal of the ages. It has been Satan's master strategy 
The sin of disunity probably has caused more souls to be lost than all sins combined. Now, unity really is the key for us to reach the world for Christ. The world will look at us, a world that is fractured, a world that is, that is broken, a world that is dis, disunity. The church should be an example of what unity is. The church should be the example of what love is. Is that when we have all races, all classes, all genders at our church, that there is a church that loves all race, loves all class of people, that loves uh, the male, the female, that loves uh, young and old and loves, uh, and the church should be that example that shows love, demonstrates love. Why? Because God is love, and we should demonstrate that love towards others. And when we do that, it will set the world as an example uh, we'll, we'll be an example of what God is and it be a place for evangelism. You know, the world will be one for Christ when the church is one in Christ. And if unity is the key to the outpouring and evangelism, really shouldn't it be precedent in our prayers that we should endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace? You know what, let's essentially pray for unity. Let's pray for unity in four areas. One, our unity with God. Jesus said that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that we, they also may be one in us. You see, there is a, a unity that we can get with God, and, and sin separates us from God and breaks that unity. And like Adam and Eve, when they transgressed or sinned against God and his commands, it separated them from God. But I have good news for us. Even though we may be separated from God by our sin, and we know that the wages of sin is death, the penalty for sin is is separation from God. It's essentially hell that separates us from God. But God, in his love, redeemed us and made it right and and sent his only son to die to reconcile that relationship jesus comes and gives his life sacrificially and essentially takes our punishment so that you and i can be reconciled back to the father when we place our faith in him repent of our sins and trust him then we can be at one with god So you may be here today at odds with God, separated from God. But you know what? God initiated this love relationship by sending Jesus to us. And you need to respond to it by just simply receiving and believing and accepting it. My friend, I hope that you have unity with God. And even though your sin might be separating us, I pray that you would repent of that and that your sin would be atoned for. And we pray that the blood of Jesus would be applied uh, to your life and that you would have union and fellowship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. We also need to pray not only unity with God, but we also need to pray unity in our homes. The Apostle Paul said, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Husband, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate or provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. We need to pray for unity in our homes. He hits all family uh, structure there. And uh, we need to pray really against contention and division, and need to pray for unity between husbands and wives, and unity between siblings, and unity between parents and children, and pray for love and forgiveness and reconciliation. We also need to pray for unity in the church. As we mentioned earlier, Paul said that there will be no divisions among you. There can be divisions within a church. And we need to pray for unity in Kirkland Assemblies of God uh, church body as it pertains to our relationship with each other. Pray for unity in our church body as it pertains to our vision, that we have the same vision. 
Pray for unity in our church body as it pertains to us being in so one, one accord. And not only do we need to pray for unity in our church, but we need to pray for unity in our nation. In 2 Chronicles 7, 13 and 14, it says, When I shut up the heavens and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, he said, If my people are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will heal from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Our land is in desperate need of healing. There are people that are that are hurt. There has been injustice that has been done against them. And they are not receiving the adequate justice that they need. There are people that are angry, that are bitter, that are that are hearts are filled with hatred and their hearts are filled with murder. There are people, folks, our land needs healing. And we need an outpouring of God's spirit. We need a revival for God to work and move and bring unity to our nation and to our land. But this passage tells us that unity will only come when we, as God's people, humble ourselves, call on his name, pray, and seek his face and turn from our way, wicked ways. Then God has promised us that he would hear our prayer that he would forgive our sin, and he will heal our land. We need to pray for our nation and healing in our nation to God to bring it today. And so I just want to encourage you this morning that if you would pray for unity, that there would be a unity within our nation, within our country, within our homes, within our marriages, and within, within our church, That unity is one of the key ingredients for God to pour out his spirit upon us. And and we are unity that we may create a strong bond so that we can overpower the enemy. We can have unity that will create a perfect atmosphere for the spirit and the presence of God to move. Pray for unity so that we can have a strong voice for evangelism and that people can come to know God through this time you know what my friend Jesus is praying for us and he's praying for unity unity matters to God my friend let's pray for unity and let's not let the great corona virus divide us but let us let us move forward in beautiful unity not in ugly division dear heavenly father We thank you, Lord, that you would bring a sense of unity to this nation and to this country. Father, we humble ourselves before you this morning, and we seek your face, and we repent of our sinful ways, O God. Forgive us, O God, for uh, injustices or things that perhaps we've trespassed against someone or Perhaps we've been trespassed against. Father, forgive us for those trespasses. And we can forgive because, God, you have forgiven us. And we have trespassed against you. Lord, we ask today for your mercy and for your grace. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would bring healing, Father, to those who are suffering uh, from injustice in their life. That you, God, would would help them, Father, to find justice. But Lord, if they don't receive justice, would you allow forgiveness to penetrate their hearts? Lord, we know that Jesus was innocent, but he had bad things happen to him. And while on the cross, he said these words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Oh God, we do ask for justice, but for those who can't get justice, would you allow forgiveness to saturate their hearts today lord we pray lord for our nation and our country lord that you would protect your people lord you said unless the lord the night uh, the lord watches over the city it's the night watchmen that guard it in vain and god we pray that you would once again protect our communities protect our cities protect our towns protect our families protect our homes and you would surround us with your protection today 
Lord, we pray for, uh, for wisdom for those, Lord, who uh, are leading this country, that you would guide them and direct them in what they need to do to help bring unity to this nation today, O oh, Father. Lord, we pray that we would turn our hearts back to you and turn our hearts to God. And Lord, that we would repent and, and call upon you and come underneath you today, that you truly would be, it'd be one, one God, one Lord, and one, one, one baptism today. And Father, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. I pray these things. Amen and amen. Well, my friend, I just pray today, if you made a decision to follow the Lord, that you would just uh, email me at kirklandag at gmail.com so that we can po properly follow up with you today. I just want you to know that Heidi and I love you and we're praying for you. And uh, if there's anything that we can do for you, feel free to contact us. Hey, God bless and have a blessed day.